thank you guys for for coming. Um, my name is Eric Rosberg. I am an account manager with ENS. But just to qualify, um, I actually was a IT director in public schools for almost 15 years. So um, the strategy that that I'm going to be you know sharing with you guys today um, it really is a is a process that that I've taken and has been augmented by a couple of the security consultants that I've worked with um, worked with over the years. Uh, ENS is a is a systems integrator out of Sacramento. Um, Primarily, our focus is, um, is, is state business, uh, and this is not going to be uh, a sales pitch by any means. This is really just to show you how simple it is uh, to, to develop a, you know, a strategy that has some teeth that can really help you guys um, you know, get the, the controls put in place and qualify the controls and quantify the controls that you need to keep your, your environments, um, environments safe. Um, so I talked a little bit about, <clears throat> you know, the, the plan, you know, coming from my experience, but when I got hooked up with uh, one of my security consultants of the past, um, his background was he was a CISO at a, a large um, health organization in, in LA. They had a breach event and um, it was non-reportable, so, uh, you know, that was, I guess, kind of good. But it did reach um, up to up to the board level. So the board, without knowing much about the technology or you know what controls to put in place, they said, "All right, just DLP. We've heard the name DLP. You're going to go get DLP, and here's all the money that you need to do it." Uh, so they wanted best of breed without you know any reserve, and they wanted to make sure that it was in, and you know going within two weeks of, of that initial go. Um, go notice. Uh, so uh, $2.7 million later, uh, they had a best of breed um, a DLP solution. And um, the problem with that is that it was $2.7 million, uh, $2 million worth of the IT budget that was no longer available to them. So um, server refresh, desktop refresh, basically just got cut from from their entire their entire budget because of this this breach event um, security tends to be um, very reactionary um, if it's got a, a you know if it's got data associated with it if it's got a power cord oh it's IT's responsibility and thus IT becomes the owner of of the risk and that's not where where it should be. Our job is to be in the recommendation business. I can give you, Mr. Risk Owner, the you know the tools and you know the the way to to resolve that risk. But you know, at the end of the day, you get to decide how you want to res how you want to respond to it. So after they got this um, you know this new DLP solution in, uh, they realized that they had no strategy around around security. So they outsourced and brought in a CISO for hire who, um, you know, was, his sole goal was to put together uh, a security strategy. They already had an IT strategy, but it didn't necessarily call out security specifically, which, is, um, which was always my issue. I mean, I, you know, being in schools, we had to have state approved technology plans. Uh, but never did they include, you know, security specific. It was all about how are you going to, um, you know, provide the platform for the teachers to instruct the students. Didn't ever talk about, you know, security. Never talked about the particulars, um, you know, getting into any kind of granularity when it came to that. Uh, so uh, the CISO comes in and he puts together this, this radical plan. Everything was going to be best of breed. Um, first year budget uh, of that particular security plan, uh, 13 million dollars. Uh, completely unrealistic. I mean, he, my my buddy was was in there. Um, he knew that they might be able to fund that the first year, but the second year, um, 
nothing was going to happen to it. It might not get funded. The personnel that they brought in to support it was probably um, not going to be funded. Um, and so all this money that they that they initially spent on you know this radical plan to be you know to be covered um, was going to go out the window. Um, so he made a suggestion. He's all, well, what if we look at this from a strategic you know, background? His, his background was in project management and engineering, so everything that he did was approached from you know, a very strategic um, you know, point of view. So you know, we, can, we can look at all the different controls, and then we can kind of you know, see what makes sense. What if we were to you know, maybe do some kind of consolidation play? Um, where you don't necessarily have best of breed in all the the controls, but you have something that is fundable, that is manageable, and we have the ability to mature over time. So the the board kind of said, okay, well, we'll go down this road with you, um, and that is basically how this came this came about. So when we talk about strategy, um, you know, driven IT security. The question is, what does that mean? Um, you know, it's kind of like saying CASB. You know, what does CASB mean? I mean, it can mean a thousand things to you know a thousand different people, depending on what um, you know color glasses they're they're wearing that particular day. Have they been breached? Um, you know, are they living in a, a Pollyanna world where nothing bad ever happens? Um, you know, so their security strategy means something completely different than you know someone um, who's who's been through. Um, been through a breach. Um, the question is, you know, why do you want a strategy? What what are the goals out of um, you know having a strategy? A lot of people think that they have one, but when it comes down to it, um, you have to ask yourself: Is it improving the results? Is it re improving the results of the organization from you know security perspective? Um, is it giving you the business outcomes that that you're hoping for? Is it reducing complexity? Um, the challenge with having you know, best to breed some point solutions across all the different controls is that you add multiple consoles, you add multiple humans, um, multiple FTEs, so that gets you know expensive, and you know you're not necessarily being able to integrate you know say a, a, a McAfee endpoint with you know a semantic CASB. They might play friendly but you know when you're getting that you know that true integration it can get really complex um, not to pick on anybody but I sold McAfee for for quite a while um, and I don't know if anybody here has used McAfee in the past but they came out with um, something called DXL um, and they had a, a product called tie the threat intelligence exchange and the whole goal of that solution was to be a bi-directional uh, communication bus for non McAfee solutions to be able to talk into you know the EPO console and then provide you know oh I see this threat going on at this endpoint let's you know shut it down over at the at the firewall that's not a McAfee solution it's a great marketing ploy but the complexity that it added to the environment in order to make it happen, you had to have you know an expert in that particular firewall who also needed to be an expert in the McAfee endpoint solution, who also needed to be an expert in Python scripting. It's really hard to find that kind of skill set in one human unless you're outsourcing it, and then again you have a problem. Okay, how much money do I really want to invest in making that making that a reality? Um, so. Uh, from a compliance perspective, once you have that strategy in place, is it improving you know, the compliance? It ought to. It ought to. I mean, just by doing the basics of you know, you know, of patching, um, you know, making sure that you know systems have the same OS across you know a certain uh, group of of uh, employees. Those are the basics, and that should immediately drive up um, you know your your compliance, and then. Uh, reducing cost is your strategy reducing the cost of your um, of your IT security. Um, you know, when you start getting into um, you know having that strategy, you'd be able to use you know some of the economies of scale, uh, leveraging the vendors for multiple products to cover multiple controls, um, thus you know reducing uh, you know a lot of the costs that are associated with um, with that. Uh, Kept talking and I didn't even need my cue cards. All 
All right, so uh, the process that we're going to talk about today, the, we're going to talk about these first two, uh, these first two columns. Um, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, assessing where you are now, um, you know, and then what are the goals of the organization. And those are two different things. So, um, you know, initially when you start looking at what are the goals of the organization, start it from scratch. What are the goals, you know, from a security perspective of, of the organization? You know, how compliant do they want to be? How much risk do they want to assume? And then take a look at the different controls that you currently have investments in, you know, across the different controls. And I'm going to show you a, a matrix, you know, a controls matrix a little bit later um, that'll help make this, uh, you know, help make a little bit more sense. Um, it's important to, um, you know, the organization to, you know, to have that plan and that, you know, you're able to get, you know, the funding from executive management around that by having um, the plan. The question is, um, how do you do it? Building, uh, you know, a framework for you guys to build, uh, you know, the, the plan on. And once you gather all the data about where you are, where you want to be, it gives you the ability um, to start creating that, that future state. Um, one of the big questions that you have to ask with your current tool set is, are you a happy customer of all those different tools? Some of them yes, some of them no. And my, my thought is that there's really no bad tools out there. If you're unhappy with a particular uh, vendor or a particular tool that you're currently using, more than likely, there needs to be a maturity program put around that. You need to, you know, reach out to the vendor, get more training, um, you know, take a look at, you know, I was having a conversation with someone earlier about, you know, you get that sprawl of, you know, all these different tools, and then, you know, we become very reactionary, like, oh, look at this tool over here, this is great, but I just spent $5 million on these tools, and they're not, you know, I'm not getting the value out of, uh, that $5 million investment because I'm looking at the new shiny tool that I saw at RSA or that, you know, some other department or agency has. Uh, <clears throat> the goal around having a maturity program, you know, is, is having good relationships with your vendors, both the manufacturers and with, um, you know, the integrators who can provide you some of the expertise to, you know, help bring you um, you know that maturity that you're that you're desiring. Um, all right. So after you assess the current state, the goal is to figure out what gaps you want to fill, and then how do you fill them. Um, starting at the risk lev the level, um, in IT security is a subset of of risk. Um, you're looking at you know data, uh, operational support, patching, um, and with risk, you're looking at you know three three different things: it's process, it's people, uh, and it's technology. And a lot of the tools, um, you know, a lot of the the risks that you have can be uh, controlled in those first two with process and people. Um, you know, adding new people into your environment. Do you have a process? Do you necessarily need a technology to onboard and offboard people? Not necessarily, but there's also a lot of tools um, that you can't, do, you know, a lot of controls that you cannot mitigate uh, without having technology put into place. Um, most of the stuff seems pretty straightforward, should be, you know, familiar and nothing, nothing new. Um, where we're going to get a little bit different in this strategy is, um, you know, how we qualify and then how do we quantify, you know, the different, the different um, threats and, and the different risks um, that are associated. In IT, we've been really good at, um, at you know, identifying um, and qualifying different problems and figuring out solutions. What I did, uh, I had a really tough time with, um, which is why I'm on the vendor side, is uh, being able to quantify and, and get you know the you know the leverage and get the executives on board to do the you know to own the risk 
and invest in um, you know mitigating those controls and that was my biggest source of um, you know of, of frustration is like guys you're you want to um, you, know, you want to deliver you want a, a BYOD program for the students in this district but you're unwilling to invest in wireless solution for you know the entire district you might do it for a classroom and a pilot but that isn't providing the byod that you keep talking to the board about and i at the time did not have the ability to communicate you know if we don't fund this our kids are not going to be ready for you know for college the way that other students in other neighboring districts are and we're going to lose out on on ADA money we're going to lose out on you know really I mean seventy five hundred dollars per student per year um, is that something that you want to you want to accept that's the risk by not putting in this this wireless solution and I was at the time unable to to do that um, so not only by quali uh, quantifying those, it not only tells you what you are going to do, but also helps you define what you're not going to do, whether that's um, because you know it's an acceptable risk in the organization, there's bigger fish to fry, um, or you just have other priorities within the organization. Um, and then once you have that plan, it becomes pretty easy to, uh, to execute on it going back and forth all right all right so NIST framework this is the good stuff right question is when you see this where do you prioritize you know you give this to you know give this to your agency director you give this to a CEO a CFO like okay well where do I start what do I do and then you have you know the CIS top 20, which is supposed to help augment and supplement you know the NIST framework. It's just a big list. It's not 20 controls. There's like you know 42 to 49, depending on you know the day of the week and you know again the colored glasses that you're looking through. Um, how how do you quantify? You know how, where do you define? Where do you start? Um, so as you know most public sector agencies we don't have the money i mean we're not new york city um you know so we don't have the funding to cover every single one of those those controls um so what we've done and here's another thing i mean going back to um you know the nist framework if i give you know the top 20 to you know a CFO in most of your departments they're going to look at this and say um dump it over to IT I, I don't know how to make sense of that I mean there might be you know a couple that they can pick out but to make sense of it and develop a plan around it they're going to be hard pressed so what we've done is we basically mapped out um, you know all the different controls in seven different verticals and this is something that's easy for um, you know, for your executive leadership to, you know, to put their head around. Um, network protection, okay, I know, I have a good idea what a network is. Okay, I didn't know that we had to look at, you know, uh, IP, you know intrusion prevention. I'm pretty sure that we knew about a firewall, but I didn't know, you know, where exactly that fell into. And the reason that we have them uh, broken out in these silos is that typically um, these are going to be different teams within your organization that are in smaller organizations I mean you have you know three IT generalists so they get all of them um, but the question is where do you where do you start so I don't have in this deck um, you know the the this is a new deck to me so I don't have you know some of the older slides that show the prioritization and the maturity um, so just imagine with me um, you know that you start with this risk matrix with all these different controls and then you start coloring in with a pencil or with a highlighter the the controls that make most sense to you and you're going to prioritize them you know I like to use the the Gardner maturity model one through five so those top you know one or two those are going to be the you know the ones that you're the controls that you have to have in place 
if you think of the internet as you know a light switch that you're going to turn on in the morning you walk in turn on it's okay if i don't have you know um endpoint in place if i don't have an email gateway in place if i don't have a you know a, you know a, a firewall in place i'm not even going to turn on i'm not even going to bother turning on um the internet and the the priority two uh controls are just as important as the priority one it's just you can't do everything all at once Three through five becomes a little bit more optional, um, you know, depending on budget, depending on you know getting those other controls uh, in place first. Once you have everything mapped out of you know what you're going to do, where you're going to go, you take a look at where you're at now. You know, earlier we talked about you know how do you um, you know assess where you are currently. So not just our we're not just going to you know highlight. Okay, we got we got a firewall. We have to start asking our, ourselves, how mature is that firewall? You know, am I a happy customer? Do I need to add some training? Do I need to add you know, different features? Do I need to take advantage of features that I've already purchased? You know, Palo Alto is a great example of that. Um, you know, I sell a lot of you know, Palo Alto firewalls, and we, you, know, you get your platform, you get uh, wildfire, you get panorama, you get traps, you get all these different things, but nine times out of 10, we're only using you know one or two of those features, but then people say, "Oh, I need a sim, or I need this, I need a sandbox." Well, you already you've already invested in it in you know in the Palo Alto platform. Why would you? you know, let's take advantage of what you currently have, and then make a determination if you need to use something else. Do you need to pivot to you know to a FireEye? Do you need to pivot to um, you know something in you know from an, another another uh, manufacturer? So once you get that in place and you've you've you know considered the consolidation play then we can start evaluating what other tools uh, we want to put in place and the question becomes how do you how do you evaluate what tools you're going to put in place do we just do a all right i'm going to do best of breed and off we go you really you're going to look at three things you're going to look at the you know the features you look at the capabilities does it meet the needs of you know what of the control that I'm trying to to take care of? How easy is it for me to to deploy and then mature and build a maturity program around those tools? And then how easy is it going to be for my team to administer and then respond to incidents that it finds? So those are the three things that we're going to look at. And if you notice, I haven't talked about any specific product for this strategy. I mean, I've mentioned Palo Alto, I mentioned Macme just because of my my experience, but I don't care what tool you buy, as long as it makes sense for your organization. Is it as long as it's meeting the need of the strategy that you choose to put in place? That's what we're trying to. That's what we're trying to get to. So, here's where I failed. That I'm able to do something different now. I was never able to get my organization behind what I was trying to do. Um, I always tried to own the risk. I would stay up night. I would frustrate myself. I'm like, guys, it's only going to cost you two hundred thousand dollars to put in an advanced malware solution. Well, why do we need it? It's two hundred thousand dollars that I can't, you know, I can't, you know, invest in our students. I can't put it in the classroom, so we're not going to do it. What I was failing to do was quantify what that meant. So, let's say we didn't have advanced malware, and you. You, you start losing you start losing records you student records not all student records have social securities associated with them but there's a good portion of the seniors that have to have their social security in the student information system and we didn't do a really good job in archiving that old data so i had you know 15 years worth of you know student data that you know, not only had grades and it had you know medical records, but it also had social security numbers. So if they started you know exfiltrating that data, what's the cost of that? You know, I mean, that could be you know as high as two hundred dollars a record. It could be seventy dollars a record. The goal really is to take the lowest the lowest number and use that as your factor. So all right, we have the potential of losing you know a hundred thousand records. Um, you know, and then multiply that by you know, $70 per record. 
that's the you know the quantification that you use so okay we have this big number we will call it two million dollars we have a two million dollar risk and I can mitigate that risk with two hundred thousand dollars what do you want to do this isn't my risk this is your risk I'm presenting a solution this is a recommendation they can choose to invest that two hundred thousand dollars without cutting into the IT budget or they cannot and once they decide that they want to either own that risk and invest in it, or if they just want to accept it, all right, we're good, we don't need to do anything, then my job would have been a lot better. Because then I could have rest at night, because it's not my problem anymore. Um, I mean, I'm sure if we got breached, um, you know, they would be all over me, but I can go back and say, look, we created a program and you decided that you wanted to accept that risk, um, you know, something that you're willing to live with. Um, really, it's how do you make your, your executives IT smart or security smart? Getting out of the technical mumbo jumbo, you know, in that um, you know in that C dot uh, presentation earlier about their breach, he was talking about bringing it down to common language, you know, taking out the the techno mumbo jumbo. Um, it may, my wife will kill me if she sees this, but she, I have to break things down for when I talk to her about what I do. I have to break it down Sesame Street style. So if I could teach a five-year-old what I do around cybersecurity or data center infrastructure, that's how I have to mentally approach, you know, communicating with some of my executives. And it's not so much taking out the technical mumbo jumbo, but it's speaking a common language that they can get behind. A lot of times, you just need to educate those executives, whether it's a board or it's your, you know, the executive team that you that you work with, it's pretty easy within you know a two hour two hour window where you can put on some kind of you know security workshop to bring them up to speed using that you know that that controls matrix to be able to understand and communicate back and forth what the risk really means to them and how they can get behind it and invest in it. Um, all right, so it's IT's job to identify risk, to analyze risk, to assign ownership to other departments, and to be in the recommendation business. It is not our job, in my opinion, to, to own the risk of HR, to own the risk of you know, transportation. The goal really is to get the business to take that ownership and be a partner with you into, um, you know, into mitigating those risks. If they don't want to get behind the risk, if they don't want to own that risk, or they don't want to invest in it, you got to be okay with it. And that's sometimes that's that's a tough thing to do. Um, you know, just I'm not going to talk a lot about this, but the risk management process, you know, identify, assess, assign, document. Rinse and repeat. You have to keep doing this over and over. The you know this this a strategic security plan isn't a static plan, and that's what I've used in the past as a you know a K twelve IT director, is we've created these you know state approved technology plans, and we look at them once every five years. You get it approved, you put it on the shelf, and you don't do anything else with it until oh crap, we have you know funding that's tied to the state approved technology plan. I better do something about that. So along with that, uh, you know the risk matrix, using an enterprise risk register. Does anyone has anyone used an uh, enterprise risk register for you know quantifying and you know, good. If you need one, I, I got tools that I'll give you for free that you know you can you can use. But basically, we're taking a look and putting on here every risk that we can identify within the organization. Once we uh, get all the risk documented, then we start assigning you know assigning who who's the owner of that. Uh, how much is it to cost year one to to mitigate that? That's from initial uh, initial purchase. That's from FTE to support it. Um, in years two and three, what are the costs going to be associated with it? 
And then one thing that we do to, you know, to go back to quantifying it is putting in, okay, if we do nothing, what's it gonna cost the organization if we get breached? Worst case scenario, what's gonna happen? So having that, um, that tool you know, really helps out management to, you know, to understand, oh my God, um, $5 million versus a $200,000 investment? Typically CFOs can get behind that. Um, so it's great to have a strategy, but how the hell do you, you know, figure out how you're doing? Having you know some kind of you know KPI or or report card to analyze how you're doing and get better. You might have a goal around you know Windows patching that you're going to be 100% patched, and you take a look at where you're at currently. All right, I'm, I got 10,000 computers, and you know 80% of them are you know at a at the acceptable level of of patching. That's 80% isn't bad. I mean my kids are in high school, so I mean they're they're going to be happy with a B. Um, but that means that two two thousand of your devices are not at a you know are not patched, which could mean you know a hundred different vulnerabilities. So, what is your response to that? Okay, give them two weeks. If nothing happens in two weeks, you can kick off you know some kind of SCCM or some kind of system tool that will force that patch and reboot. If they still do nothing within you know within thirty days, shut them off just lock out their account and so they can't get on until they get that you know that um, that patching uh, up to up to snuff um, the one slide that I didn't build out um, automatically um, you know just just to reiterate you're gonna identify what the what the goals of the organization are from a clean slate, and then what are the associated risks with um, you know that you currently have in your environment? Document, prioritize those risks, identify and assign risks to to the proper uh, individual. Um, present your findings to them and let them make the decision around what they want to do with that risk, and be a partner with them. That's really the goal: is to be a partner. I know in K-12, I keep going back to that as a reference, but you've asked anybody in the organization what they do for, for a living outside of IT, whether it's a custodian, a principal, a teacher, you ask them what they do, oh, I'm in, I'm in education, and I'm a secretary, I'm a teacher. You ask anybody in the IT department what they did, I'm in IT, and that's where they left it. There was that disconnect from, okay, as an IT person within a K-12 organization, my job is to be in education. So that's actually starting to change a little bit. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the, the, the cool things that I've seen come out of this, uh, there's a, a school district in, in a neighboring state. Um, he, got a, he got a hold of the risk register as we were going through this process with him. So, oh man, I, I need I need a CISO. I need you know two warm bodies to, to manage my sock. And so he wrote out you know in the risk register you know what it would cost, what the you know what it was going to be from a you know financial you know position if he didn't have those those two bodies in place. Took it to the board, set it on their desk. Said, all right, what do you want to do? He said, okay, we'll give you those three bodies. Well, what he didn't anticipate was that I was going to kick off a, a yellow book audit. So it's, you know, they went through, um, started looking at everything that they were doing, and then basically came back at the end of the day and said, all right, you're doing everything that you need to do. You've, you know, documented, you've, you know, you've signed the risk, and we really like the, you know, the, the way that you're going, so keep on doing what you're doing. Um, so that's all I got. And I would say, you know, your questions, I would rather have more of a discussion because I'm no expert. I'm just a guy who's passionate about technology and, and helping you know, government agencies get the most out of their tax dollars. So, thanks. Yeah? So I, was, I was not very clear when you mentioned that how you prioritize those uh, this initiatives that uh, you come up with. How do I prioritize them? It's going to be different in every organization. Uh, you know what? You know what, Scott? Whatever you you know, prioritize at you know your agency is going to be different than what you might do at say Orange County. But you know, you're working with you're looking at those those different controls. You have to define all right. What are the things that I have to do 
what are the controls that I have to have in place before I turn on the internet? So that might be firewall, that might be endpoint, that may be desktop encryption. Who knows? I mean, that's, that's completely up to you. This is the maturity that we're at now, and then how do we want to get to the maturity in the future, which is kind of like your strategy, and then what are those things that are feeding into that strategy and those little tiny things, and then you prioritize based on what that, those goals are. Okay. That's one approach. Yeah. Yeah. One of the bigger problems that we have with executives is you say, well, you know, there's this risk here, we want to buy this, and there's this risk here, we want to do this, and there's this risk. Uh, in general that we want to do this and this this and then um, you know there's a real um, fatigue uh, and hey guys yeah you agreed to buy this three years ago but we decided we want to change to something else now and um, there's an amazing amount of fatigue so I think that um, even when you say okay we really think that based on thumbnails we want eight hundred thousand dollars of budget this year but then you come time to spend it. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. then you need the approval to actually spend the individual items. I mean, not the 10,000, 20,000 we have signature for it, but you know, we want to spend 100,000 over here and 200,000 over there. Oh, absolutely. It's a lot of fatigue. Yeah. A lot of fatigue. Because we have an array of devices and tools, and <clears> the, um, it, it only gets bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and so having a consolidation play is always, in my opinion, a, a decent approach because it gives you the ability to reduce the overall spend, you know, going back to, you know, that healthcare system where the initial budget was going to be $13 million for the first year. They turned that around with a consolidation play, and I think these, uh, it was somewhere around 7 or $8 million for a consolidation play. And so they ripped out the initial... Um, you know, DLP solution that they had. They went with, you know, one that they were able to consolidate on and, you know, saved them, you know, half the, half the budget. So, I mean, that's, you know, one of the things that you, that you get to do is identify and keep smiling. Yeah. yeah I think it, the biggest issue is the additive. Yeah. You know, you've already got all of this and you're saying, you know, we also want to add, um, you know, Pam, and we also want to add two factor. We also want to add this, and we also want to add that. Yeah. I think and if you take it from a holistic um, a holistic approach by looking at all the controls at once and, you know, two factor to you, um, you know, who owns that risk? You know, what is the you know, what's the potential if you don't have two factor? And then give that risk to that you know, that individual and they get to decide if they want to fund that. And if they don't want to fund it, all right. I let you know. I did my job. I, I, I'm in the recommendation business. Right. I mean, I think from an IT perspective, just generically, <clears throat> we are, especially on the cyber side, we are in the risk management business. <clears throat> um, and depending on the executives you're dealing with, they may or may not take the responsibility of saying, or you know, of that, okay, yeah, that was the decision I made or she made or whatever. But then others are like, well, you didn't do a good job of selling it to me. Because if you had done a better job of selling it to me, I would have said yes. So it's your fault. <laughs> that is certainly, uh, that's certainly something that comes up. <laughs> I think the other mentality that well face is a lot of folks think cyber is a one-time fix. Right? Yeah. A lot of programs are one-time fix, where it's, hey, we got to keep them keep their attention and make them realize that, hey, it's always changing, and as a result, I'm always going to be changing our roadmap from the standpoint of what we're going to try and accomplish. And then one of the things that I found very effective is point to events in the world and say, see that? That's why I keep asking for stuff. Um, and I've gotten to the point where sometimes events in the world happen, and now they're asking me, hey, what do you need from that standpoint? And mm. so it's been really effective. And, you know, we talked about Colorado today. Uh, when that's unfolding and happening, point to that to say, you know what, that stuff I'm asking for, 
I'm doing that's it why. <laughs> yeah, and, and we do point that out. I work for the Port of Long Beach, and we've had people across the water and certainly our own tenants get hammered and be on the news. <laughs> and uh, so, I mean, that's always very helpful. Close to home. Yeah. 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 We also do cybersecurity awareness uh, that we try and make some internal um, competitions. So we do quarterly activities that, you know, not only do we do the big annual in, in uh, October, uh, but we also try and do some uh, quarterly stuff. But it's still, um, you know, it's interesting because it's, it's really, as we get more mature, it's not just defense in depth, it's also defense in depth. Mm -hmm. And so that just, it's a, there's so much fatigue talking to uh, the boss and the boss and the boss and then the big boss. <laughs> and then there's also what, what we're dealing with is there's so many things that we want to roll out, and then it's fatigue of all the employees also that you're rolling out too. And so we've noticed because we want to implement two factor and NBM and we're even having the broaden perimeter, so we want to try and help control that. And it's getting harder and harder because the more things that you roll out, the more the employees either push back or say why why. And even the executives, why do I need to have two factor? Well, it is important, and so then you need to get that executive sponsorship, but then rolling it out to everybody and communicating it, and why do I need them to text me? Well, I think about your bank. Like, you you don't want anybody to have your bank account information. So we're just seeing a lot of that, too. Well, um, we, we haven't yet rolled out. We have two factor for our uh, all of our third party consultants, but not internally. But uh, the conversation we've had, and, and we all, most of us have really good relations with the executives, and we're all a tight team. And, um, is that when they talk about, well, you know, I'm just the executor, you really need it for these people. I go, no. <laughs> you have to actually be you because you're the biggest risk. <laughs> you're the executive director, you have the biggest risk. You have two deputies underneath you, they're both the second biggest risks. <laughs> You know, because they seem to think that it's, you know, some risk over here. No, no. You're the boss. You're actually, by far, the biggest risk. Oh, yeah. You're the target. <laughs> so I, I love, you know, when you, you hear from, you know, just run-of-the-mill staff, a, a secretary or, you know, a speech pathologist or someone who isn't in IT who doesn't think that their, you know, that their credentials can get them, you can get you anywhere. I'm like, all they need to do is get on the network. They don't need your credentials. You're just the vehicle that they're going to use. So you don't leave your password taped to the bottom of your keyboard, please, for the love of God. <laughs> so. Oh. <clears throat> All right. Anything else, guys? Any other questions or discussion points? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you.